what is the state of the city of Houston? Good evening, I'm Laurie Johnson. Welcome to Red, White and Blue. He served more than 25 years in the Texas House of Representatives and over those years, he served as a member of the Legislative Budget Board and was Vice Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. In November, Sylvester Turner was elected mayor of the city of Houston. In his first four months, Mayor Turner has had to deal with a $160 million budget shortfall and a city paralyzed by flooding. And in his first State of the City speech, Turner announced that former city council member and civil engineer Steve Costello will serve as flood czar. He also asked for a pension reform deal by year's end, along with the removal of the property tax revenue cap that would help balance some of the city's budget deficits. Some say that he's strategically making swift moves to fix city issues. Others argue that his administration is not moving quickly enough when it comes to the issues of naming a new police chief, fire chief, and a director of public works. So tonight we ask, what steps did Mayor Turner take to balance the upcoming budget? What is his four-year plan? And what concerns does he have for the future of Houston? Tonight, we are pleased to welcome the mayor of the city of Houston, Sylvester Turner. And leading our discussion are hosts David Jones and Gary Polland. You know, this is a job where you, you really wanted it, didn't you? I mean, it, it, uh, a quarter of a century, and, uh, and you're mayor of Houston. That's, that's persistence. Well, you know, if you don't want it, you, sh you certainly shouldn't seek it. Are so, you regretting uh, it now? Um, I, am, I have absolutely no regrets. <laughs> if I could do it all over again, I would do it all over but again. Here's an interesting, here's an interesting question. You uh, ran, when, when, when did you run for mayor the first time? 91. In 1991. In 1991, a lot of the problems that the city faces today mm -hmm. uh, were in their infancy. Transportation being one. Transportation, Tra traffic. Uh, pensions, traffic, flooding, all of it. Right. Do you think, if and, and, and you were always a, a go-getter in Austin, you were certainly not someone sitting there and, and not getting anything done. Do you think you getting elected mayor in 91 would have put us in a better position today as a city? Oh. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> that is the strangest oh, question. That's a hard question. <laughs> you know, let's put it, I, I would have been, enjoyed it back then, but this is the perfect time now. You know, so uh, every, everything has its time and its place and its mm. season. I think this is the season for me. Okay, so this you budget know. now, uh, <laughs> it spends $82 million less uh, in uh, 2017 in the, than it did in, than right, in, right. in 2016. Um, the uh, Chronicle characterized it as 94 one-time fixes. Well, I characterized it as, as, as uh, uh, creating a balanced budget from an historic um, <laughs> low that was a $160 million budgetary gap. It's mm -hmm. the largest since the Great Recession. So it doesn't matter how you do it. If we didn't do any, uh, anything that's in it, it's not something that hadn't been done over previous administrations. But the good news is that um, it was a $160 million shortfall. We now have a balanced budget. We did it in a very fiscally conservative fashion. We did it a month earlier than it's normally done. It's normally done at the end of June. We did this at the end of May. There are obviously no Republicans on the city council. I mean, uh, it, was I mean. Unani <laughs> it was a it was a unanimous vote, yeah. yep. and uh, and it was done in record time. And for what I'm told by people who've been at uh, uh, city hall or watched it over the last 30 years, it's the first time it's been done in such a short period of time and in a record time. With, with a new administration board. taking over. Yeah, because yeah. you take over, no, it's, it's, it's not like you were in the beginning of the budget process. You're deep; in, it was deep into it when you took over. I had less than six months left in, in the in the fiscal year. I came in the middle of a fiscal year, um, but I give a lot of credit to the members of city council that worked and partnered with me uh, to get it done. So that's I think that's that's the message that shouldn't be overlooked. And well, I'm, how about how about this, Sylvester? Okay. The challenges that remain, as I see it, are. Uh, that you have 27 million in mandated employee uh, pay raises is coming up, and you have a 29 million dollar pension right. payment, right. and then you have the promise of a pension deal right. uh, for November the first. In right. fact, I've read this, and this is a great quote that you gave. Um, <laughs> you said that well, we will resolve the pension debt by November. We will remove the revenue cap. We will get oil prices up, and this city will take off. And that is absolutely correct. <laughs> that, that, that's what I said, and I and I stand by it. Uh, look, at the beginning of my term, people said that we weren't going to address potholes in real time by the next business day. Well, up to this point in time, the employees have filled over 17,000 potholes defined by five feet by five, not two feet by two, and they have done it 95% of the time by the next business day. When I came into office, there were many who questioned whether or not we could balance the city's books when the budget shortfall went from $126 million to $160 million. We've done that with the unanimous vote of city council. We've done it a month earlier, and we did it in record time. 
So I don't want to lose sight of, of what we have done. Uh, are there big issues on the horizon? Absolutely. But we're going to take them one, one day at a time. And I'm confident that if we continue to work collaboratively, uh, we, we will get it done. And Gary doesn't believe that by removing the revenue cap, it's going to be making it easier for you to accomplish revenue your goals. Revenue cap is the most horrible thing that's been done to this city. <laughs> you cannot, and bear in mind, we are the only city in, in the state of Texas that's operating under the revenue cap that we have in this city. Not even the state of Texas under the most conservative leadership. Uh, operates under the same measures that the city of Houston is has self-imposed on itself. Both Moody, uh, Moody S and P, and Fitch Credit Rating Agencies have all uh, dinged us on the revenue cap that we have in place. We are the fourth largest city, soon to be the third. We are growing, developing, vibrant city with tremendous needs. You cannot be competitive with other cities in this state or in this country, quite frankly, across the globe. If, you, if we are operating with one hand tied behind our back. So the question is, what, type, what sort of city do you want? If you want a, if you want a secondary city uh, in an international arena, then yes, keep the yes. revenue cap on. Okay, and, and, and I understand your concern that it doesn't, revenue cap is not on anybody else, and, and, and right. to be fair, it ought to be. And I understand that, it, right. and I agree with you that it should be placed on everybody, because here's the problem. What's that? When you talk about let's get rid of the revenue cap, what you're really saying is let's raise taxes now, again on the people. That's, that's, the, that's, that's, that's the spin, and that's Actually, the spin, that's not the substance of the argument. Statistics. 2,000 prior, 15 mm -hmm. property tax revenue to the city is mm -hmm. 1.073 billion. Right. It's up 97 percent since 2000, mm -hmm. which is 6.4 percent a year. That's money you get to keep. So 6.4 percent a year mm -hmm. of revenue increase. And what you're telling me is, at this point, mm -hmm. and, and, and I understand you're early in your term, you're not responsible for everyone who's come before you. I'm not saying that. But the first thing we're going to do is we need to find more money. No, that's the last thing we do. No, and who's, what tax, should rate, be whose doing tax rate was raised in order to get this new revenue? <laughs> okay. Okay. So you have that. You have right. increased revenue coming right. in every year. So what, right. what should we be doing before we say let's raise taxes? We need to take a hard look at city functions. We're Are we the most efficient, most effective? And I know you're working We're on that. We're doing all of those. That's things. very important. We're and how much that saves? I don't know. It's going to save something. I mean, one example we've had is mm -hmm. when we get calls for our ambulances. The fire engines go out. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem very efficient or effective to me, but what do I know? Mm -hmm. I don't know that we use best practices throughout it, and I understand it's going to take time to, to get this all and cleaned Gary, out. We're, take, we're taking a look at we're taking a look at all of that. That's but what you, smart. But, but what you cannot de deny is that over the next 10 to 15 years, more than three million people are going to be moving into the Houston region. That's the equivalent of putting another Chicago in the Houston region. You cannot deny that every single day, 557,000 people come into the city of Houston during the daytime. I was, uh, the, the population in the city of Houston increases by 27% every day. That's the equivalent of putting another Atlanta in the city of Houston every single day. You can't deny that we have flooding problems in this city. We're we have transit that. mobility concerns in this city. We have an income inequality problem in this city. You cannot meet the essential needs of the people in this city. And, you, and we are operating under a revenue cap. And if the revenue cap was so good, then why isn't it imposed on other areas and on other jurisdictions? And I told you, and I why, think it should be. And why isn't the state of Texas <laughs> under the most conservative leadership? It should be. And I was on, and I was on the committee, on the, on the board, that set the spending limits for the state right. of Texas. The state of Texas, under the most conservative leadership, does not operate under the same conditions. Well, we have a spending a limitation. That but, it, but, but much more generous than that of the city of Houston. Right. But so, what, so what I would argue is that if we want to be a competitive city that meets the needs of a growing city, that meets the needs, provides flooding um, uh, mitigation efforts, and addresses transit and transportation, then we are going to need the, the resources in order to deal with it. Now, I've never advocated getting rid of the revenue cap right now. What I have said is that once we demonstrate that we can operate in a fiscally prudent fashion. Which you're working on. Once, once we have uh, uh, come up with a resolution to the unfunded pension obligations, then the city of Houston, Houstonians, in November of 2017, should remove the revenue cap and allow us to move forward into the future and be competitive with other cities across the country. And you, didn't, right. and you I, didn't say, as you said in the, uh, in the campaign, no, Gary, you've talked I, I a lot. Had, I had to <laughs> Right, right, right. I was going to follow uh, up. The, yeah, well, I'm following up on the same subject. Yeah. You, as I recall, whenever you talked about removing the revenue cap in the campaign, you used the previous time that it was 
um, uh, raised, I guess, uh, to allow for more money to come into the police department. Into you're not, you're not, you're not putting limitations on uh, whatever new revenue might be coming in as a result of getting rid of the cap. Are you? No, I mean the, the reality is, is that in, it, the revenue cap came into place in 2004. Uh, Bill White was the mayor. In 2006, he asked the people in the city to add another 90 million on top for law enforcement purposes, and the city agreed, and we did. But now we're running up against that added cap. We have roughly 5,200 police officers in the city of Houston. 1,900 of them are eligible to retire. In order to build the police force up, it's going to cost money to add more police officers to the force, which we desperately need mm -hmm. because people want to be safe and many feel unsafe. Well, those are things that cost. But what? I, but, but again, the point that I'm making is that until we, until we demonstrate to people in this city that we can operate in a fiscally prudent fashion. Once we have done everything that we can do to squeeze every dollar, uh, 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 to utilize every dollar in a, in, a, in, a, in a fiscally prudent fashion, and once we have reached a resolution on unfunded pension obligations, then I think the city Houstonians need to go to the next step and remove uh, this revenue cap, which is which is hamstring in this city, it is okay. not in the city. All right, so you say, so you have some. There's, there's, you got to walk before you can run. That's what you're basically uh, yeah. saying. That's fine. Okay, a couple other ideas True. that would make sense: zero based okay. budgeting for the city, that ought to be done, and uh, city determining what its priorities are that you really need to fund, and what are secondary priorities. So the the city gets gets right. what it needs to do the basics right. Now, where's, <laughs> where can you find money? I know where you can find money. Where, where can the Terzas. They take $125 million and, from the general fund. It should go and, back to the general fund. And in this budget, in the, and in the budget that was approved by city council you've got unanimously, $19.3 million come from the ter will come from the Terz, not just this year, but in subsequent years as well. Yeah, but as, about, a part of, you, as a part of shared you, uh, sacrifice and them paying their their responsible share for the extra costs that are incurred within their geographical if, limits. If, if, we, if we eliminated the Terzas, they're not in blighted areas like the Galleria, Memorial, and other places, that would bring in a whole lot more revenue to the city. And in fact, uh, a check indicated that the Terzas' cash balances on hand in the bank is almost a half a billion dollars. This is hamstring the city probably more significantly than uh, the revenue cap. Right, but they're, but they, but they're participating. So why don't we get rid of them? Well, they'll 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 participate if if they weren't coming to the table and they were not working, let's say, with me and the members of the city council. That would be one argument. But they have come to the table. And I think there are some vital the functions that they can serve. But everybody has a role to play. Uh, and again, I mean, if you look at the budget that was passed uh, by the city council unanimously. Um, it's not a budget that's, that's giving out money. It's, that's, it's $82 million less in the 2017 budget than in 2018. We've streamlined department operations. You know, there are $36 million well, in, in, in department reductions. And I think being a good reductions. steward of the money is very important. Right. And I agree with yeah, you, Mayor. And you, uh, you certainly, uh, certainly uh, you can talk about money all day long, but we still have point. public safety <laughs> yeah, that he has. We're not ready. <laughs> we're not ready yet. Okay. One of the concerns that, that yes. you have, I mean, you talked about what you'd like to do if, yes. you, if you got the revenue cap right. lifted for public safety. Yes. Okay, like it was done previously. Right. There's a feeling among uh, voters of betrayal on I'm Rebuild sure. Houston because Rebuild Houston was supposed to rebuild our streets and, and get our flood infrastructure in shape. And I think it's fair to say uh, you inherited a train wreck of, of our in infrastructure and our, and our flooding system <laughs> is beyond belief. That's one of the reasons you appointed a flooding czar. Uh, so rebuild Houston. My my reports tell me rebuild Houston in the budget for this year. No money is going to new projects. Every dollar is but going to payroll. So we've well, got to be able to establish trust among the the consumers, right. and, and, the, your people, and your if, folks. I mean, our you know, people I, who pay taxes you. that that they're getting the bang for the buck before you go back to it and say, hey, give us some more dedicated and I'm funds. A, and I'm going to tell you what I, what I tell to the members on city council who were there last year. If you want to put those arguments to last year, that's fine. But those arguments don't apply to me and to the budget that we're putting forth. And, 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 and from day one, I said to the people in the city of Houston, we will repair these horrible streets and we will do it in real time. And people, I believe, are seeing the results of what I said. I made a promise and I've kept my promise. And so the streets in the city of Houston since January are better. They are being
and improved. Final question on Rebuild Houston. Are we going to get Rebuild Houston back to what it was originally promised to the voters for? What, what, what voters, the, I think what, what concerned voters is that they were paying their money in real time, but they, they, they didn't see the results of their money. I think if you go and ask them now, they're seeing their streets being repaired. We're now doing not just filling potholes, we're doing more serious street repair. So people are able to see that their money is being used. I will not take one person's dollar and not put it on the purposes for which it was intended. Otherwise, I won't collect it. We, have a, we, uh, we need, we need a, a police chief. Yes. And um, let me make one recommendation, that that be an outsider rather than an insider. Um, we, just had a, we, sh we just had an officer get a judgment of close to 200000 against the city because he was demoted simply because he uh, outed certain officers who were misbehaving, maybe committing right. violations of the law or, 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 or policy. Um, uh, and there came up that there is a code of silence, which the union chief, of course, denied. So we need a police chief that is going to end the code of silence. I assume that you can agree that there are some possibilities that there are such uh, there are, there is such a culture. I, I think, I think, I think in any department you're going to have some some problems that need to that need to be uh, addressed. Um, now, the interim chief, Chief Montavo, is at the helm of the of the force now. And quite frankly, I think right now the city is fortunate to have her at the helm, uh, because when you have a situation, for example, like Jose Josue Flores, who was killed, 11 year old, in the near north side, uh, the very fact that she was at the helm at this particular time, I think, has served. Uh, some, uh, has been very uh, valuable and productive for the city of Houston because many of the people, for example, in that community and other communities can relate to us, she can relate to them, and the HBD has responded and, and have, has done an excellent job. So everybody will be assessed and evaluated uh, as we move forward. But within any department, I think you're going to have some problems that need to be addressed. Uh, does HPD have problems that need to be addressed, uh, whether it's a code of silence, what have you? Um, you know, if I said no, then I would be naive. But the reality is, is that I, you know, I'm proud of the fact that we have 5,200 police officers who are operating under some ex extremely difficult circumstances that are having to police 644 square miles uh, under some very difficult set of circumstances. Have you read what Chicago is doing? Um, Chicago has a uh, has I don't know a, if I would use Chicago as an well, example. Well, no, I, I, I would think I would I would think I would no. look at this particular project that okay, they've developed. Well, right? uh, they've got an algorithm that is set up with all of the police science that they have available to them that has identified where the people with guns are who kill people and who hurt people, and they, using you know their gang history, the criminal history, and then they went out and they raided and arrested tons of people. Uh, using this very sophisticated algorithm and oh, that, uh, that, that predictive predictive analysis right yes. right right so um, there's uh, the, the New York City Council just decriminalized all of their regulations that were you know as, that brought people to court on for with with a summons and a fine possibility converted them to uh, civil process, and we're and we're looking at doing some of those things. Those uh, those would be those would be important we, things to get right. people uh, keep people from having criminal arrest warrants for. Uh, right. we're, and we're looking at doing some of those things. But I mean, when you compare the city of Houston, for example, with other cities in terms of police relations, I think in, in by and part our relations with the police has been is pretty is pretty good. It's not perfect, uh, but I think the community and, and law enforcement and law enforcement community are working fairly effectively. Um, well with one another and we always would continue to do more. Um, so what about a police chief? When are we going to get one? Well right now Chief Montalvo is at the ham and I want to see how she operates. I think she deserves an opportunity to perform and I will tell you at, at a very critical moment in the city of Houston uh, right now the very fact that she's at the ham is a, is a big big plus. I think everyone deserves an opportunity to be there and I simply wasn't going to make her as the interim knowing that she was going to be pushed out the door. She's been on the force for 35 years. She She's come up through the ranks, and uh, and I want to give her the same opportunity that I would want someone to give me. So I'm going to be respectful. I'm going to see how she does, and then we'll we'll go from there. What I will say, there are some who say, Sylvester, why haven't you named a, a director of this and a director of that? I'm not into personalities. I'm into results. And I'm not going to be moved by what someone else says in terms of what my timetable should be. As long as I'm meeting the needs of the people in the city of Houston, to me, that's all that matters. But it's not about personalities. 
It's not about who's in charge of what. The question is, if I put you there, do you give me the results that the people of the city of Houston expect and deserve? And if you can do that, I'm good. If you can't do it, then you need to go. Makes sense. All right, pension. We talked about pensions. Yes, uh, pensions. Little, big bugaboo. Municipal employees' pensions, 52% cash on hand to pay accrued benefits. Mm -hmm. Unfunded liabilities of all the pensions is now estimated at least $5.6 billion. Uh, you inherited this train wreck. You were, of course, a witness to the train wreck in Austin as a leader in the legislature. What are we going to do? Well, I'm this here. Is, this is, this, if we don't solve this problem, this is the big, the big nut for you to deal with it. You know, and fortunately for you, you don't have to do it in two years. Well, you know, it, it's not a wreck yet. It certainly is it's a train on the track <laughs> that's just going down, and, and it needs to be uh, decelerated. Uh, what I've said is that we'll reach an agreement by the end of October. And, I, and I have, I'm insisting on two things from all of the groups. Number one, that the unfunded pension obligation that has already been accrued, that that $5.7 billion, that that amount comes down and keeps going down. And secondly, that the annual cost that the city has to pay, the ARC, that that cost co come down and continue to go down. Uh, those are, are my requirements. Bring all of those, the, instead of going up, I want the cost curve to go down, and I would like to, and I am asking that we reach a resolution by the end of October. You know, one of the things I, we were troubled with, we had a couple of pension, we had a pension show, in fact, mm -hmm. I don't know if you watched it. Uh, one of the experts told us that the city had a contract that guaranteed an 8% investment performance in the pensions every year in a, in a, in a 1% interest world. And if and so I asked the the expert who used to work for the city, what happens if like the market doesn't perform at eight percent, which it's not? And he said the city's on the hook for the difference mm -hmm. in the money. That's of, that's another kind of ridiculous thing. All of, all of those things are on the table. I will say to you that I've had several conversations with all of the groups individually and collectively. The conversations are produc productive and the conversations are going well. So uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, I know it, it, it won't be it won't be easy. But it wasn't easy to solve a $160 million shortfall either. Many people thought that we weren't going to be able to do it. And you have people out there who are running for office and all of that who are being very negative. But um, I don't see them criticizing the budget after solving a $160 million. You have a major million. talent working for you named Stephen Williams, um, yes. who is intimately involved in My Brother's Keeper. Yes. Uh, I've, read, yes. I've read a lot about the program. It's, come, it's a Washington-based yes. uh, program. Unfortunately, it's still relying upon private, private sector uh, c uh, contributions and in-kind contributions yes. mm -hmm. with ambitious goals. I mean, is this a, can we call this a legitimate program or it sounds like it's a great society program without without the money behind it? And what's your assessment of it? You know, it, it, the, the goals are, are, are great, they're admirable. Uh, Director Steve Williams is, is, has taken leadership in charge of it. Uh, it has been successful in attracting a lot of private dollars to it. Uh, it is now in several of the schools uh, within the city of Houston. It has excellent, excellent potential. I, I intend to put my full backing behind it because uh, there has to be a relationship with, with uh, a lot of the students that are in school now. We can catch people early and provide them with some guidance um, and, and some goals. Um, then I think we can go a long way in, in really getting, keeping them on the right track. So I think, I think it's an excellent concept. It's still being built out, but, uh, but Director Steve Williams is doing an excellent job in providing leadership. We're down to under two minutes, and yes. we haven't really talked about floods, flood control. Yes. Uh, and we've had, what, 300-year uh, floods in the last year and a half. And you just got sued of, by yeah. residents of Memorial. Yeah, and, you know, I, 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 and they're frustrated. I'm I, sure you I, share I their that. frustration. I mean, people have been, their homes have been flooded two, four, seven times. I got it. People don't want to hear the verbiage. They don't want to hear politicians say, you know, we're looking at it. Are we going to? Do they? People want to see things happen in real time. Uh, but it's true. A lot of a lot of things have taken place up to this point in time. Um, and so, uh, am I in a position to tell people that I can do some things right now? And two months from now, your home, your neighborhood will not be flooded. I can't. What I can promise people is that we intend to take some definitive state steps. To mitigate the risk. Do you think you can bring everyone to? I mean, because first of all, the city of Houston doesn't control the whole watershed, which complicates things. Can you bring all the players uh, through your czar to the table? The county, I believe, uh, I, the surrounding counties, I believe, uh, major business, mm, uh, etc. I believe so. The relationship between, for example, the city and, and Corps of Engineers and, and Harris yeah. County is, is excellent. Uh, county Judge Ed Emmon and I work well together. I've had many conversations, for example, with Commissioner Cagle, Gene Locke. Uh, 
uh, give me some other, uh, Commissioner Rag, Rag. Uh, Commissioner Mormon. Mormon is working with us on some things Great. in Clear Lake. Uh, with respect to the Corps of Engineers, we've got to bring them to, to the table. Text Doc, and then I am heading to D.C. Um, in a couple of weeks to visit with the entire uh, con um, congressional delegation, uh, including Republicans and Democrats. Uh, being hosted by Congressman uh, Kevin Brady. That's great. Uh, to discuss well, flood and uh, issues. Don't forget to say hello to Mr. Culberson. Oh, yes. And and John Com yes. Congressman Culberson and I right. have several oh. conversations. So, uh, yeah, we can get we can achieve some results. Mayor Turner, it was a pleasure. I guess we could go to part two, Laurie. Could we? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Don't forget that every week, following red, white, and blue, you can continue the conversation online with Houston Public Media's digital series, Political Perspectives, featuring Jay Iyer and Brandon Roddinghouse. Starting at 8 p.m., log on to HoustonPublicMedia.org slash perspectives. And remember, you can catch Red, White, and Blue every Friday at 7.30 p.m. here on TV8, and again Saturdays at 6.30 p.m. We also invite you to visit us online and send us your comments. We want to hear what you have to say about the issues that affect Houston. You can submit your comments at HoustonPublicMedia.org or on Facebook, and don't forget to like us. Thanks so much for watching. Good night.